Schoolism's having a sale. From now until June 3rd, get $100 off a year's subscription to classes taught by industry masters, from illustration to painting to design, 28 classes in all. We've already added two new classes this year, Introduction to Visual Development with Victoria Yang and Environment and Light with John Burton, with three more coming soon. And they'll be available to subscribers right at launch. The Schoolism Spring Sale. Check it out today at schoolism.com. Welcome to Series 2 of The Core with Nathan Fowkes, hosted by Bobby Chu. Nathan Fowkes has been one of the top concept artists in the entertainment industry for over 20 years. His credits include The Prince of Egypt, How to Train Your Dragon, and Wonder Park. In this mini-series, Nathan will get to the core of concepts and ideas that he teaches in his schoolism classes. We hope you enjoy it. Hey Nathan, thanks very much for your time. I want to ask you some more stuff about color and light, designing with color and light. Specifically, what are some important aspects or principles to keep in mind when creating believability with our color and light? Okay, yeah, that's a good one. And I have, I, I have my answer. This is the thing that resonates most with me personally. And different people will be different, but I think this is useful to some degree across the board. And the answer is lost and found. So one thing, as I've tried to figure out uh, early in my career, and even back as a teenager, there were certain images that were just so compelling to me and other images that I just didn't, didn't grab my attention. And I realized what it was eventually. The images that were most engaging to me left information out. It was almost as if what was left out was as important as what was put in. And now after all these years, I firmly b believe that's true to the point of being an axiom we can hang our hat on. What's, what we don't put in our images is just as important as what we do put in the images. And here's why. Every one of us, no matter what we do, we want our images to be engaging. I don't think there's an exception to that. In some way, we want our images to be engaging. And so when you put in what's important and then let, I don't know, the shadows go into mystery, the light go into mystery, the background go into mystery, the foreground, whatever might be secondary, people are smart. They've got a brain and they have eyes. And if we have a well-crafted images, their brain and their eyes fill in the gaps. That means they're literally participating in the painting. And all of a sudden, we have an engaged audience. If we hit them over the head and show them every bit of everything, it's like we're saying every part of the image is equally important, but therefore every part of the image is equally unimportant. And that's a quick way to lose our audience. So in terms of color and light and the color and light class, we, we do so much about how to use color to create contrast. Uh, contrast of the value, you know, the lights and the darks is an aspect of color. So uh, contrast of value, contrast of color hue, contrast of color saturation. And then there's the obvious, there's a the contrast of light and shadow in terms of uh, bringing definition to what's in the light and maybe secondary, being secondary in the shadow, or vice versa. Some images will want to be about the shadows. And we'll want to let the light go into mystery. That goes against the grain. I think all of us have a gut level uh, uh, instinct to want to put so much information in the light. But an artist, a trained artist, will go against those base instincts that can really work against us. Because uh, so many art students, the gauntlet that they, uh, they, they walk through in the battlefield on which they die is managing all of those contrasts. There's so much stuff where we can lose our way and we can lose our audience. And so that's the key. What are our images about? Absolutely. Now you've been teaching uh, for a good while on schoolism. So you've seen a lot of assignments, which means you also seen a lot of mistakes. So I would love to give the the viewers some 
just some free tips on what are the common mistakes that take away the believability when people are, you know, designing with color and light. Let me think about this one. Um, because we have a range in design, and it's a range I think we have to be aware of. On one hand, we've got, we have complete believability that approaches photorealism. Some animated movies do that in, in a way. On the other hand, we have stylization where the movies, the concept art is highly stylized. It's, uh, it's quirky, it's whimsical, it's unexpected. And most of us are somewhere on that scale. And so we've got to decide what's appropriate for our own work, what's appropriate for the show that we're working on, and how far we can take that. Because professionally speaking, I've seen amazing artists who have a very stylized, very quirky, and, and interesting way of working. And sometimes they are the hero. Someone wants to do a movie that's entirely based around that style. And when that happens, you're, you're, it's, it's beautiful and life is good. But then when that project is over, there might be a period where nobody needs that style. And maybe plan B is to have your book, your children's book, the other side projects that you might want to do personally. Those have to be on board uh, because an artist who goes to an extreme away from believability is going to have to have different ways to reach an audience because it's a little bit more of a niche thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll make a confession, Bobby, something, uh, something I don't mind admitting. Sometimes on some projects, I have found myself to be on the B team. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. There was an idea for a movie, and they hired crazy, let's try this, let's try that, and bring all these different new things to it. They absolutely should do that. It's the right thing to do. I'm thinking of a particular project, but I don't want to name names because, uh, because pe people will know who, who the people I'm referencing are. But So it, it was great, but that design did not translate well into the 3D world. And after a lot of excitement and enthusiasm, there was a big dust up and they swept everybody away, took the project apart, fired the art department, fired the director, kept the story, did another pass on, and they brought me onto the project. And they brought me onto the project, uh, uh, among other people because it was, okay, we just got to make the movie. We want this release date. We need something solid. Nathan knows how to do believable color and light. Nathan knows how to create a level of believability that the audience can come into, can step into, and live in that world. At the same time, uh, Nathan just doesn't do photorealism. Uh, what we want is to tweak that so that the lighting has a mood that's appropriate to the story. The color design has a mood that's appropriate to the story. And so there's a believability, but it's a stylized believability. It's tweaked so that it's molded towards each story moment and the appropriate mood for each moment of the story. So wherever we all go in our style and in our approach, if we nail that thing, if we elicit the mood and the emotion from the audience, if we reach out and grab them at that gut emotional level where I think storytelling lives, that's the moment that we're doing our job. That's the moment when we are a real artist. Now, I would assume that when people are taking a course and they're you know, excited about doing color and light, that they are going to show you the most garish, the most saturated colors at, you know, in their assignments. And that, that would be, you know, I'm assuming that that would be one of the bigger mistakes um, when trying to create believability with color and light. I'm thinking of a specific example that we can, that we can jump into. So I, I did a painting not too long ago uh, at the L.A. County Fair. And so you can imagine 
uh, at a fair. Imagine the, the it's it's a carnival. It's it's not quite a circus, but might as well be. There's the tents, and the tents are yellow and red. And there's all the flashing lights, and there's all the carnival games, and the music, and the callers calling to the games. There is just uh, a sensory overload of visual information there. And here I am trying to do this sketch. And it, it's evening. The sun is starting to set. I mean, you have an hour if you're lucky. How do you deal with a situation like that? So here's what I did. I said to myself, what can I unify in this image? Well, the image is filled with warmth. There's all these warm local colors. The objects, the reds, the yellows, they lean towards warm. And I have warm sunlight shining through. So that takes all of that stuff and gives it a unity. So there's one. That's, that's one way to control all the variety. And so number two, uh, there is the light and there's the shadow. And so I chose to simplify what was in shadow, leave out 90% of the information in the shadow, and put the information in the light. And so that's number two. I've unified by grouping the shadow, but pulled information out in the light. Then, right where the shadows, I'm thinking about, you know, there's a tent canopy in the shadowy area underneath that. And then in front of that shadowy, shadowy area are people. And those people are catching backlight of the sun. They're kind of exciting. And a couple of those people had blue kind of cyan, blue-green shirts on. And it was amazing against that warm background. It just sang. And so I totally cheated. I gave a bunch of people cyan shirts, even though only one or two, actually it was three, I still remember, uh, only three people out of many had shirts on kind of that color because they were the main event. Those were the things I wanted to pop out and kind of be a rhythm that carried you through the image. And so I carefully chose what I was going to unify and how I was going to unify it. Unity of value, unity of color temperature. Those are some of the basic ways to unify. And then another way uh, is uh, another way is rhythm. How do you take all kinds of stuff and make it meaningful? Well, you give a kind of a flowing rhythm, make one thing feel like it belongs to the next, and then it belongs to the next. And that's what I made sure the people did. And so by simplifying and then popping out those important elements with contrast, contrast of hue, contrast of saturation, contrast of value, and thinking about rhythm and massing and so forth, uh, my, my hour was up. I, had, uh, I will say that I brought it home and touched it up a bit, pushed and pulled a little bit at home. Uh, uh, I, I, I do that uh, frequently if I feel like I need to. And the, uh, the painting is, is out there. It's a painting that I've posted online and uh, came out well enough for me to be willing to share with the world. And it was that unity with variety, tough choices that I think made it worth uh, looking at. I know the painting that you're talking about, and I, I felt the same thing. I was like, wow, there's so many colors, and yet it all works together. To learn more from Nathan Fuchs, please check out his classes, Designing with Color and Light, Environment Design, Pictorial Composition, and Landscape Sketching, available now for registration and subscription only at schoolism.com.